Hey, what's up? This is Kevin from Kevin's Barbecue Joints, and this is awesome. This is episode three of Wine and Barbecue with Aaron Fijis. Yes, we made it to episode three. A lot more coming up. This one is just killer. It's long. It's really long, so I'm going to keep this intro super short. Our, our guest, Chris Poldoyan, I'm butchering his name, I'm sure, but it's Chris. He is just fantastic. He's engaging. He's excited. He's so super knowledgeable about wine and anthropology. He and Aaron had worked together and he talks all about that. They both talk all about that. He's a sommelier. He's now studying for his MBA in France, which is just amazing. For a month, he's in Chicago. We caught him there. So this was perfect. But this is just spectacular. This is the reason why we have this show. This will get you so hyped and so excited about wine and trying new wines and learning about wines. We talk specifically about three different wines. We, we, as in Aaron and Chris, talk about these three wines, and they are super interesting. I'm not, I'm not gonna blow anything because it's just, listen to these stories. You will love this so much. During about 45 minutes in, I had to step away for about 10 minutes, but the two of them continue talking, and this is the joy. I've never had this joy before of having a co-host, so Aaron could, take over and do a better job than I can and it, this is spectacular hearing the two of them talk about a wine event that they put on in the early days of Fiji Spring Branch talking about Spring Branch in general things that I hadn't discussed with her and then after we're done with Chris we Aaron and I get into their five barbecue sauces in depth we get into their Easter event their crawfish Easter event which is coming up which sounds killer I wish I lived close we talk about their charro beans which is something very new to the menu. It's at both locations and a couple of other things, but I don't want to, I don't want to extend this any longer. You're going to enjoy this. I can't thank Chris enough for joining the two of us. Enjoy episode three of Wine and Barbecue. Well, good morning, Chris. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. It's a little chilly and foggy here in Chicago, but um, other than that, it's, it's quite nice. Happy to be here with y'all. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. Definitely. We're really excited. I'm fucking yes. stoked. I don't know about you guys. I'm very <laughs> excited. I haven't seen Aaron um, in a very, very long time. So even in this virtual setting, in this 2D environment, it's lovely to see you. Same. I feel the same way. I'm like so giddy that we're going to have you as our guest today. Yeah. And it's also too, and I'm also, I'll put a link below. I am insanely jealous of your Instagram feed. It's so, uh, I don't want to get, I want to get a little bit into that too, but Aaron, if you want to uh, start things off, and then I'll kind of throw in my okay. Kevin-ness. So welcome to the third episode of Barbecue and Wine. Um, today, I'm so excited to announce our guest on today's podcast is my friend, Chris Paul Doyen. Uh, he was my boss slash really good friend for um, a few years when I was really kind of emerging in the wine world. He's taught me so much about wine and he also was a really big helper in helping us create our wine list so i'm excited to, to talk to him about barbecue and wine but also about some of the fun things he's had going on because you've you've had quite an amazing year um traveling and studying abroad so we're really excited to dig in on all that do you want to get a little background of yourself chris first for the listener slash viewer and then that way yeah totally for yeah. sure so um my name is chris and i currently am based in uh, chicago but i'm getting my mba in france at a school called INSEAD. it's about an hour south of paris it's the uh, number one business school of europe so i was running a bar in houston texas called camarada covid happened i pivoted out of running the bar started my own little beverage consulting firm with that came a podcast, with that came a variety of different wine clients. And then I just realized that there was a lot more to the world that I needed to see and needed to do. So I decided to get my MBA. I decided the best place to do that would be in France. And now I'm studying abroad here at uh, Northwestern's Kellogg School of Management. So not in Chicago proper, just a little north in Evanston. Had the opportunity to work with Erin. She's a fucking rock star. And uh, I think the barbecue at Fiji's yes. is some of the best. I'm on coffee number two today, so I am lit. The, um, <laughs> the caffeine is flowing through these veins. It's a magical thing. You can't get iced coffee in Europe. So I don't care that it's like 30 degrees outside. I will drink my iced coffee because this is like my time to get it. Because once I go Again. back... It'll be dark roast espresso. And why, just like, why that's a market. That seems like a business opportunity. 
maybe, you know, if this whole um, wine thing doesn't work out for me, I'll just be slinging cold brew in the seventh arrondissement. They'll find me there. So. That sounds great. I think Chris and I have a huge alignment in like what we value in wine, what we enjoy in wine and the producers that we really like to support. So because of that, what I like, he likes and what he likes, I like. And so our menu is really reflective of a lot of Chris's own preferences I believe I don't want to speak for you so do you feel um, like you're shaped by his probably a little bit but I also just think that I, I honestly think that we just align um we kind of independently came to some of the same conclusions about oh, cool. what is important to us and and what we enjoy and if I can it's add fun. on to that yeah um I think the other thing that both Aaron and I recognize is that it's not about necessarily what we really love drinking it's also recognizing what the guest will enjoy drinking so That's when we were building that. this list out together it was like it would be really dope to put this one kind of weird, funky wine on the list, but is it going to sell? Will it resonate with people? Will the staff be able to communicate in like five seconds or less to the person standing at the counter what this wine is all about? And I think That's that is the really hardest smart. thing as a wine professional is like recognizing the list isn't just about you. It's a, it, at the end of the day, it's about the guest and that's a huge part of it. So, and I think because of Erin's background, working at the kind of restaurants that she has, her experience at Williams Sonoma, my experience running wine programs for Hillstone Restaurant Group, which people in Texas might know as Houston's restaurant. Um, That's how we know it in Los Angeles too, yeah. Oh yeah, there we go. Bandera, the South Beverly Grill, uh, uh -huh. Gulfstream down in Newport Beach. I mean, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I worked at the location on Avocado Avenue back in the day. Um, oh really? Down oh. in um, yeah, the Gulfstream location, which cranks. It's insane. Oh, it's you know? so yeah, it's it's so busy. And the one I lived in Santa Monica for a spell, mm, and there was yeah, that one, the Hillstone like Second. Yeah, there was, it, mm -hmm. there was I think a Houston's at one point, and then it switched to. Hillstone. They all were Houston's at that one, one point, point, and then okay. there was a a little switch up. Um, okay, about I think like in 2010 or so, but um, yeah, but all those experiences working for that company for like four or five years really helped me kind of synthesize a more guest focused um, dining experience and wine experience. And I think Aaron's experiences similarly informed her about that more guest centric attitude. And how do you deal with that on a, on a note? Like if, if people do you find that certain wines aren't selling and see, or, and people aren't interested or it's hard to explain after like, because some, because they're not going to always know right off the bat, what works. Is that something that is difficult to get rid of a wine and then start it? Or is it I just think something you have to do? There's always like a little bit of like, um, I think pride and ego tied up when you place a wine on a list because you're like, this is a wine that I'm yeah. excited about and I'm going to put it on there. And in the case of most of the wines I work with and the wines that Aaron works with, right? These are like small family owned wineries. So you really feel like it's their, like it's them, right? Mm -hmm. And if someone's mm -hmm. like, I don't like this wine, sometimes it can be like, oh, they, they don't like the ethos of this, of this winery. And what I always remind people, right, is that if they don't like the wine or the wine's not hitting for whatever reason, like at the end of the day, that's why Baskin and Robbins has 31 flavors, right? You know, yeah, yeah. there's not going to be the right wine for everyone and recognizing that like maybe at a place like Fiji's Barbecue, people aren't coming in necessarily for like a wine experience the way you do at a wine bar where you're there to explore, try different things. You go to 11 Madison Park, you expect the Psalm to kind of like walk you through the experience and you're kind of in their hands. But you have to recognize that at sometimes a counter service restaurant, like people want to come in, be able to immediately order and be comfortable with what they get. Right. So I think that's a big part of it. I mean, Aaron, do you feel the same way? What's oh, yeah. kind of been going on with the wine list over the past couple of months? I mean, you nailed it with like the three criteria. It needs to be something that resonates with the guests and it needs to be something that the staff can communicate and, um, and something that really embodies our values. And so we, have learned since the beginning. So you did a phenomenal job of really helping us like hone in our original menu. And we knew that the menu was while small, bigger than probably what it would ultimately end up. And so we've kind of narrowed it down. We've really focused on what we're seeing our guests enjoy. And we're able to control who we bring in, like what producers we bring in. And so you'll find a lot of the wines we have tell a story um, because in my opinion, that's really helped our, our staff communicate to the guests their enthusiasm for the wine because it's so easy to remember a story, particularly if you're not really experienced with wine mm -hmm. and you may not know how to pronounce all the locations and wine regions and grapes. Like some of that's you know hard even for people that have some experience with it. So for me to just communicate a story that they love and want to share, they sell that wine. And um, in our 
I think our guests are really, you know, they like to see things that they recognize. So again, we've got to be a little bit careful about what types of wines we put on the menu and where they're from. But I've also found that they're also willing to adventure with us. We, we sell a ton of the, the Kush Brut, the Origins, which is an Armenian wine. And I think that takes a lot of trust for people to just say, okay, I've never had any wine from that region, but if you say it's good, I'll try it. And we, we sell a ton of it. And we're going to talk about it more today. So I'm excited. Well, especially at a barbecue place. I think that is just, that's what makes me so happy. And that, Chris, is the reason why I wanted to do this and we, why Aaron and I started talking about it and we jumped into this was because of the opportunity to you know expand people's horizons with this. When you think about really good barbecue, most people don't think of wine they just think of beer probably you know if, if they think of alcohol at all chances yeah. are maybe it's just big red or you know soda or something like that or Chico or... um yeah exactly so i think that the opportunity to have this really versatile beverage right i mean there's so many different styles of wine and there will be a wine that works really well with barbecue and all mm -hmm. different styles of barbecue and i think we were able to put together a list that kind of reflects that how close is the list to what i know that aaron you're, it's constantly changing but how close is it to what you guys originally had thought of? Um, it's probably about 60 to 70%. Oh. I, I mean, it's smaller, but what has remained um, is a lot of some of the original wines. And as we go and replace things, if we can't get the next vintage of something, we go with something that's very similar in ethos. And I honestly think like, Chris would be so proud of the menu if he, you know, was able, if he was in Houston locally and could come in and, and drink some wine with me. I know he'd be like, this is a pretty baller wine list. But yeah, it's it's deviated a little bit. And you know, it's not even because so much of guest preference. This year's been really unusual with like availability. I think wine producers are struggling in the same way everybody else is. And so we ran out of stuff, couldn't get, you know, couldn't get the next vintage in. And so we had to kind of scramble to find the replacement. But either way, we are, uh, I think, still really in the framework of that original menu. And that's huh. something that I don't think people think about all that often is that wine isn't, you know, a consistent product that's available with the same amount and the same consistency from one year to the next. You know, this is an agricultural product and a lot of Europe got hit with really bad frost last year. Like some of our favorite producers in the Loire Valley, which is this region of France where Sancerre is from, some of those producers lost 90% of their yield due to frost and hail and shit like that uh, in 2021. Burgundy was decimated. There were all these places that they're just not going to be able to make wine, especially the smaller producers, like the ones that uh, resonate with Aaron and me, like those guys, they yeah. don't have gigantic vineyards that they can work with. They've got a small plot where they get a certain amount of juice every year. And if they lose the grapes, they can't make the wine. So mm -hmm. it's a really big issue. And for some of your listeners, maybe they were aware there were some really rough tariffs that were put into place in 2020. Mm -hmm. And that totally fucked over a bunch of like small importers uh, that, you know, work on very small margins. So the fact that there was like a 50% tariff put on some of these wines, it really kind of like decimated some of the relationships between producer and importer and importer and distributor and distributor and retailer. So how are you seeing the climate there now? Not the, the physical climate, but the, the mindset and how people are, are people excited? Are things changing since? Yeah, I mean, so yeah, so like, over, uh, did you, and then also too, sorry, did you move over there during the pandemic? Yeah, so I moved to Europe in uh, the summertime, so like in August of 2021. So when I got there, uh, you, when I got there in August, there was outdoor dining still available. There was indoor dining, um, but it was all very limited. It's not like in Texas where things reopened a little more quickly. Um, they were a little more cautious um, with the reopening of things. But small tastings were going on. You could visit some wineries. Some were open to having people. Um, and then obviously with like Delta and then Omicron, we kind of had like ups and downs of closures. But in general, there's been a huge, I don't know, just enthusiasm and excitement for things to get back to, you know, the way things were before when it comes to hospitality and when it comes yeah. to, you know, drinking. I mean, a big part of the wine experience is this communal kind of party yeah. camaraderie. Uh, going to these like wine tastings or wine fairs or meeting with producers 
So being able to do those things, I mean, there was a huge wine festival in the Loire Valley, that region I spoke of earlier last month called La Dive. It's like the biggest natural wine tasting. Um, and it was a party. It was huge. There were people from all over. The winemakers were happy to be back together. People were popping bottles. It was a, it was a wild Was that match. one with the or- architecture, the photo that you had that was beautiful architecture and then the bottle, all those bottles? Yeah, so so there the main fair is called Le Dive Boute, and it takes place in a cave. There's this really soft limestone soil called uh, Tufo in the Loire Valley, and what they did is they built a cavern in there, and that's where that major tasting goes on. And this has gone on for like over a decade. It's like the biggest thing. It's like I don't know the Oscars of of the of the natural wine world, oh, but yeah. without the slaps. Um, and um, <laughs> yeah. then yeah, from good. that. From that, there are these little satellite fairs. So only about 150, 200 producers can show their wine at La Dive, the main fair. So then there's all these additional fairs that go on in the days preceding the La Dive Boute or in the days after La Dive Boute with other producers from all over. So basically this tiny little town of Angers, this other town of Samour, these areas just like blow up with all these wineries coming in from the United States, from South America, from Greece, from Sicily, from Slovenia, like winemakers oh. from everywhere. It's not just French producers that go. Okay. So yeah, it's a huge thing where people can network. And with these smaller producers, they have the ability to really develop relationships with new importers, um, with new buyers. They don't have the same kind of like trade channels as a large conglomerate. So it's that really, really cool. I'll put a link to that below too, to your images, but also to the, that because- I want to do that someday. You should absolutely go, man. I just have to say, you've kind of pointed out another thing that barbecue and wine has in common, and that is festivals and the extreme excitement and joy that people are feeling right now because we're able to get back together and celebrate. So we just had the Houston Barbecue Festival this past weekend. And it was just, you could just tell everybody was so happy to be back together and it just felt good in celebrating what we do. And, and like you said, it's all about networking and meeting the producers and the people that, you know, do the supply chain and everybody's there and the community's there. And uh, just seeing your face light up when you talked about it just got oh. me feeling, it was like, got yeah. me feeling like how I felt on Sunday, you know, super excited. Happy yeah, I, want, I wanted to weave that in later on, but that's perfect. No, that's a perfect segue to that because that was such a, and it's, it also, it's also that, kinship and being with people that are like-minded and it just kind of and it kind of levels the playing field of humanity that we're all you know just want to share each other's you know kindness and and that's and also too like you were it seems like the wine world wants success for other wine like at least most of the wine world you you know want success for each other no for sure it's a rising tide raises all ships you know it's yeah. that mentality. But I think the other thing, right, is that with these smaller producers like Le Loon, like Kush, like a lot of these smaller producers, right, like they understand that they can't be on every single wine list either, you know, mm-hmm. and because it's small enough production, sometimes you're going to be with one winery. Sometimes you're going to go to another winery. Sometimes you'll work with one wine, you'll move to something else. So yeah, yeah. it's not like, I don't know, tied where it's like, this is always sitting on the shelf. And if it's not there, we've lost, you know, <laughs> market space or whatever so definitely I, I was gonna ask before Aaron asked a question uh, does how how much does it matter about the people that are making the wine like it's that's I know I under that's that's a big deal to both you guys right the, the families or the the winemakers right that's that's a big deal right? people are the most important aspect of just about everything we do and everybody who I feel is truly successful in life understands that and they care about the people. So for like us in our business, I feel like we're pretty, we're pretty people oriented. We really care about our staff. We like our staff. We enjoy hanging out together and we want to make sure we're supporting our team in all the ways that we can. And likewise, I think a lot of the wineries um, and producers that we work with have a similar mindset. They understand the importance of people, their own people, and also the community that that then supports them and that they're part of. And I think, I don't want to speak for Chris, but I think that's also something that's been really important to Chris. That's why we've become such good friends. I mean, we were coworkers who became good friends. And I think that's just a testament to the relationships that you can build professionally. Well, I'm sure you guys probably noticed that too, but during COVID, especially like everyone kind of was siloed off. They were in their own little bubble. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, my network of people, my, the people that I saw as like my like broader community, it suddenly got like a lot smaller because there's someone that you keep in touch with because you go to their bar, you visit them there, you go to their restaurant, you say hi to them there. But then during COVID, it's like for over a year, like the number of people that I interacted with was much, much smaller. That was yeah. a tricky thing. And you were some, you were, you were a sommelier. I mean, you're, you are a sommelier, but at the time you, you were a sommelier at the restaurant or were you running the bar yeah. program? Or how yeah, so I ran a bar in Houston called Camerata. It's where Aaron worked for a couple of years. And that's why um, it's familiar to me. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and what we ended up doing is we did a bunch of barbecue pop-ups with Erin when she was in the process of opening up Fiji's barbecue for the first for the first time. And we did some really amazing like wine and barbecue events. I think the last one that we did was maybe like a Labor Day weekend or something like that. Um, yeah. But that one that was, was super cool. But like how, yeah. but because everything had to do with customers, like things changed dramatically for sommeliers around the world. Yeah. And I mean, that's when I pivoted out and started doing just like beverage consulting. So I started a podcast where I interviewed winemakers, sommeliers, chefs. We had Aaron on an episode. We had um, actually the winemakers for one of the wines that we're going to talk about in a little bit. Shant and Diego, we had them on the pod. And, and it's called and by the, on, for anyone who needs to know, it's called by the glass. I'll put a link below for sure. You can stream it on Spotify, Apple, Google, Stitcher, wherever you get your audio content. So. Yeah. <laughs> and it's but. awesome. I've listened to four episodes so far. I, I don't, my time is, is uh, limited. I'm helping my mom through some surgeries, but this, it's so good. So good. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think that, and those conversations are a testament to it. There's so much to wine. It's a really interdisciplinary product, right? Like, yeah, there's the geology of the soils, there's the geography of where the wine is made, the climatology, but there's also that anthropological human element, um, which I think is like so, so important. One of the importers that we had on, he imports German wine and he talks about the human scale of winemaking that, yeah, you can go to the store and buy like a $10 bottle of whatever wine, you know, whatever brand that maybe has a kangaroo on the logo or a barefoot on the logo. And that's wine. It's alcohol. It'll get you a little lit, but yeah. does it tell a meaningful story? Is there some like artisanal element behind it? And in some cases, yes, but in other cases, not as much. And I think when you're supporting a small, you know, family owned business, whether it's a barbecue joint or a winery, there's something that feels good about that. Um, there's something that you feel like you're really making a difference out there, which is, I think, all we really want, right? Yeah. And we live in an opportunity, like a time right now where there, there is an opportunity to do that. Yeah. You can choose. Like it's not, you're not just four fed six different wines or anything these days. No. Should we talk about the wines? Well, where are you guys going first? <laughs> I, I propose that we start with an Arminian wine that Chris introduced me to, and he recently visited them, father daughter duo winemakers. And so I'd just love to hear a little bit more from Chris about his experience being out there and how cool and amazing you're from Armenia. So it's, it's like you going home as well. Yeah, no, for <laughs> sure. So, um, when I left the wine bar, I started taking on different, you know, um, consulting clients for brand strategy and things like that. And one of the companies that I worked with was an importer of Armenian wine, uh, called Storica and kind of the main wine that they bring in is, uh, this sparkling wine Kush, which is the first syllable of the winemaker's last name. So the guy's name is Vahe Kushkarian. Okay. And Vahe was born in Syria, but uh, was raised in Beirut. And during the Lebanese Civil War, he immigrated to Italy. His parents were like, this is not the best place to, for you to grow up. Let's send you off to Italy. And it was while he was in Italy that he really started to learn about wine and became passionate about it. Um, I don't know how familiar you are with Armenia. Uh, you mentioned that you live in LA. Yeah, so. no, it's... Uh, th most all yeah where I, I, say, I live Glendale. in Hill, yeah. and I'm li yeah, Glendale of course but Woodland Hills there's yeah. a tremendous amount of that the community is a huge Armenian community here. shout out to my Armenian brothers and sisters living in your neck of the woods Kevin so <laughs> um yeah but Armenia is a place that's like dealt with so much conflict over the past 100 years you know there was the Armenian genocide um mm -hmm. in the 1910s and then after that you had USSR coming in kind of absorbing the the region and kind of winemaking lost its identity during that time. Can you Armenian explain where wine... it's located too? I yeah, absolutely. Know. Yeah, for sure. So if you imagine the Anatolian Peninsula, kind of where Turkey is, mm -hmm. kind of jutting out into the Mediterranean, and then you just go further east, you'll hit Armenia. Its borders to the south are with Iran, border to the north is with Georgia, 
border to the east is Azerbaijan and border to the west is uh, Turkey. So you've, I, I don't know if that helps too, too much no, with does. those countries, but yeah, you're in this really kind of like interesting nestled area that's really the birthplace of wine. If you look to the oldest winery uh, that was ever discovered, it was in Armenia. Georgia is home to some very, very old winemaking as well. But there's this really amazing confluence of just like history and anthropology in that region. Oh, I love that. So, so, so it's super, super cool. Winemaking there dates back over 7,000 years um, in Georgia and um, over 6,000 years in Armenia. So, so you've got this amazing kind of like long history of winemaking in the area. And really, it's only in the past 100 years that that winemaking got erased by uh, the Soviet occupation. The Soviets basically turned to Georgia and said, okay, you get to keep making wine. In Armenia, we know you've made wine for a really long time, but what we need you to do now is just make some brandy for us because we're really thirsty for brandy. We already got one of our other satellite states working on the uh, the wine stuff. Oh, so my Lord. <laughs> So you have these like ancient vineyards and this long history of winemaking and it, it, and it all kind of got erased for the sake of brandy production. So all these vineyards converted from using the grapes, fermenting them, making wine to then using that grape juice to make brandy. But then after the Soviet Union kind of collapsed, there was this huge influx of people that had fled Armenia over the past hundred years that wanted to return people kind of repatriating to the country. Armenia is a very small country. It's got 2.8 million um, inhabitants, but the Armenian diaspora worldwide is about 9 million. No, so, I can imagine. Yeah. And I mean, of that 9 million, half of them are in your neck of the woods over in LA, <laughs> they're right? All, they're all, <laughs> which they're is all over what? in Glendale. Uh, Vahe was one of those people. He had fallen in love with wine when he lived in Italy, um, started uh, importing wine to the United States. He started a winery in Tuscany. Um, and then eventually in the mid 2000s, he returns to Armenia. Um, and with this winemaking expertise that he had gained living in Italy, he um, starts a winery. And he found this amazing vineyard in this uh, village called Kachik. So Kachik is right near the Azerbaijan border. Oh. So this is actually land that's in conflict right now. So when I visited the vineyard over the summer, like there's a military base nearby. If you look into the distance, you see contested land between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Okay. It's an, inc an incredibly just like intense area. But amongst all of this kind of like geopolitical conflict, you have these hundred plus year old vines. These are own rooted bush trained vines, which means that they're planted on their own rootstock, which isn't very common around the world because of all the different disease pressures mm -hmm. that exist. Um, so these are like sustainably grown vines that are producing these incredibly concentrated grapes uh, of indigenous varieties, uh, grapes that you don't find anywhere else in the world. So Voskeat is the main one. And then there's also some Katuni. So these are these two varieties that are relatively high acid with kind of a floral character. They get very physiologically ripe. So I know Aaron's got a glass of it in front of her, but this is a sparkling wine made like champagne in the traditional method that has this like concentration of flavor. And part of that is because the vines are so, so old. Um, they're able to just produce these really concentrated grapes. Um, but the other thing is that these vines are grown at an insane elevation. And for some of your listeners that maybe aren't familiar, the higher up you go in elevation, the more exposure to UV light you get, the um, bigger Understood. shift generally between daytime and nighttime. So you can have over 30 degrees temperature swing from like daytime to the evening. And as a result of that, you end up with grapes that are really, really ripe because of that UV uh, exposure. But then because of those cold evenings, there's still a really bright acidity to them. Oh. And so what I love about this wine is it has this depth of flavor, this complexity um, that comes from the way in which it's made, but also just when you drink that, you're, you're, you're tasting, you know, centuries of tradition, you're tasting, you know, something that it's really fucking hard to make wine in a place that's a fucking war zone, right? Yeah, no, so here they are just doing that it. alone. So yeah, to me, it's like such a cool thing. Um, really, really special. These are some of the highest elevation vines in the world, especially in the Northern Hemisphere. They're the highest elevation vines in the Northern Hemisphere for sparkling wine. Um, so really, really cool. Super Have fun. Have you tried wines from them before or is, were they? Basically, Storica is a very small, young company and they're importing these wines. And when I tried it for the very first time, they had sent me a couple of samples before um, we started working together and I tasted it. And, you know, 
going back to what we talked about earlier, there's a million sparkling wines in the market, right? This one had a very distinct flavor, that really bright citrusy aroma. You can taste that kind of limestone soil going on in there. And I don't know, for me, it's also like, as an Armenian, there's not a lot of representation for Armenians out there if you exclude the Kardashians and Jack of Orkian. So this is something that's really special and something really cool that we can share with the rest of the world. And I got to say, I did it for the culture as much as anything else, you know? What would you pair it with? So for me, at least, like when I think of the menu at Fiji's Barbecue, I think of like the um, smoked turkey that they have on the menu. I think of some of the whole hog, you know, something like whole hog, especially where it's like so fatty, there's like that richness to it. Coats your mouth. You want a glass of something really sparkling, very effervescent, very high in acid that can kind of cleanse your palate out. Um, Aaron, I mean, do you have any thoughts on what you'd go with the Kush? Yeah, I mean, well, I was going to zero right in on our smoked turkey or smoked half chicken because we already recommend those meats to be served with the Alabama white sauce. And I feel like Alabama white sauce goes really well with this. Again, I think the acidity, the sauce itself has a lot of like flavor and characteristic to it. Um, This is the Alabama white sauce, right? There's the Alabama white (laughs) sauce. Like I said, we pour this, we only have three sparkling options, two by the glass. And so it's this one and then the Cleto Chiarly Lambrusco, which we talked about in the last podcast. So when somebody comes in and they say, you know, they may not even really look at the menu. They just say, oh, do you have anything sparkling? They're always happy. I mean, this is a really, really beautiful glass of wine. And most of the time, I think people can drink it and enjoy it. And they don't even really understand the depth and complexity of what Chris just spoke to about the history everything that goes into making this glass possible for you and it's affordable and it's just really enjoyable. And to me, that's so great. Like you can know if you want to know, or you cannot know if it's not, if all you want to do is just come in and enjoy a glass of wine, this is a really great glass of wine. Um, But if you're interested in something that has more to say, this also has a lot to say. A lot Um, to say. Thousands of years of something to say. And so to me, that's just, that's what's so fascinating about wine. Um, there's a lot of wine that has as much complexity in history just in the, you know, the years that went into making this glass possible. And so it's really cool. We have about seven bottles left. So we don't, we don't have a ton left. We're waiting for more to, to become available. But if you like this wine, come now. Yeah. Because I, I can't tell you when it's going to be back. But really, I've just been really happy to have it on the list. And so thank you, Chris, for introducing me to Kush. Oh, man. I want... <laughs> now I need to get this one. <laughs> Is there anywhere in Los Angeles like you can get this? Yeah. So if you actually go to Storico Wines website um, and you go and I can send you the link so you can put it in yeah. there, but on their website, there's actually a spot like where you can go to find the wines. Okay. And I know that they're distributed in California. So I'm sure that they're in a variety of different spots in the city. So excellent. Yeah. Probably Super Wally's cool. or some, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a shot. Thank you. They also know. do a Kush Rosé, which is pretty, pretty fucking good. So oh, that's, yeah. thank you so much mm-hmm. for that. That, <laughs> that alone, that's, and, and also too, do you go into further depth about them on your podcast? Is that something that? No, so I haven't, I haven't had oh, Vahe good. or his daughter, Amy on my pod. Um, this is exclusive. But- yeah, there you go. Some exclusive, some <laughs> exclusive deeds. But um, what's really cool is that, you know, winemaking started in this part of the world, right? It started in Georgia and Armenia, Lebanon, you know, all this part of the world is where winemaking really began. But when we talk about the quote unquote old world or the original winemaking regions, everyone's mind goes to Spain, France, mm-hmm. Italy, mostly France, right? Which, you know what, they make great wine there, right? Like Bordeaux, Burgundy, great places. But there's kind of been this erasure of where wine originated. And slowly there's been this appreciation that, you know, these people that have been making wine for thousands and thousands of years, they deserve to get recognized as well. So I I think it's just a great thing that over the past, you know, decade or so in the wine world, we've started to think about these wines, not just in like a, oh yeah, they're like, they're a footnote in the textbook or not just like like a token thing that you put on the list, but they're really making some exciting wines and we, we should be more excited about them. So oh, and kudos to you for doing that, for helping. I like that's, I think that's wonderful. And also it feels like I've, I've noticed in the last few years, <laughs> maybe five years that there's a lot of things that are footnotes in our textbooks that uh, 
that we didn't know about that I wasn't aware of. So this is great. Thank you. I appreciate that. And the only other thing I'd say about that, right, is that when we think about this part of the world, this very historical place like Georgia and Armenia, our mind immediately goes to like very rustic styles of wine, you know, like orange wine, which is white wine made like red wine, where it sits on the skins for a long time. And those wines are great. And there's a certain rusticity to some of them. But sometimes people are taken aback when they're like, oh, sparkling wine from Armenia. But isn't that like, I don't know, like the Middle East, shouldn't they be making like this one style of like Mm -hmm. orange wine or something? And again, that just plays into people's perceptions of like what they think a region should be doing, you know? And I think also too, I think people don't even know that Armenia even exists. I think they think of it as just a people as opposed to like, it's almost like a mythical place. Yeah, we got to get Pete yeah. Davidson over there. That's what we should do. We'll That's bring him we back. Should. <laughs> <laughs> if it's going to happen, it'll happen with them. Yes. Well, I'm curious how many people are going to Google it. When you gave your little geography description of where to find Armenia, I guarantee you people are at the moment like Google Armenia <laughs> and seeing it for the first time on a on a map, even though it's it's right there where we really focus a lot of our attention, I think, politically on this region as a whole, but we don't really focus on the smaller countries in there. And um, so now there's going to be a lot more people that are familiar they're, they're, with Armenia. Should we move on to one of our other wines that we're featuring today? Sure, I'd love to. Okay, so this is a wine I'm also really excited for Chris to speak to. This is the La Lune um, Cabernet Sauvignon from 2020. We do not have this on our menu regularly. We poured it for a very special dinner. We had a, our first guest chef collaboration with our friend from Finland, Aki Kanunin, which we introduced in our last podcast. And we, uh, this was one of the wines. This was the wine that we paired with his dish. Um, it's a beautiful wine, very, I think, young and fresh um, for being Cabernet Sauvignon. I think it's blended with some Merlot and maybe Grenache, but it's, it's beautiful. It's ripe. So Chris, can you tell us a little bit about La Lune and the people behind La Lune? Yeah, absolutely. So Shant and Diego are the two gentlemen that run this winery. They met in winemaking school. So UC Davis is kind of like the big winemaking yeah. school in the United States. Um, there are other enology programs, but that's kind of the main one. And these two guys met while they were there and they both really hit it off. And they were making wine and you're taught in an academic environment how to make wine in a very specific way. But they realized that the wine world was much bigger than that. And there were other styles of wine that they were more interested in. So they spent time each working individually with some like very natural leaning producers in France, um, in Burgundy, in Beaujolais, and then eventually um, worked their way back to California. And their big thing is like, they believe that winemaking begins in the vineyard. Um, that that's really where the magic happens. So they farm a lot of the vineyards that they work with, uh, which isn't typical, right? Most people, they might buy the fruit from the farmer and then use that fruit that they get to make their wine. They take a very active role in helping farm those vineyards. And they do something called biodynamic farming, which I don't know if listeners out there are super familiar with kind of biodynamics, but it's kind of a step beyond organics. So where organic farming is all about like not spraying pesticides or herbicides. This goes a step further and thinking more about kind of the holistic health of the vineyard, thinking about it almost in a like spiritual sense, like what's going to be best for these vines? What's going to be best for just the ecosystem? And that means like co-planting other varieties of, you know, agriculture there. So having biodiversity in the vineyard. So it's not just like row upon row of grapevines, but have other things growing in there, vegetables, get animals in there that can kind of like, rather than mow the the grass, have some sheep come in there and do their thing. And the Le Lune name refers to the lunar cycle. So rather than saying, we're going to harvest on this date, you kind of look whether the moon is waxing or waning, and you use kind of more naturalistic guides to get to the right kind of like date to farm, date to harvest, great, right date to bottle, things like that. So they really just take a very thoughtful and mindful approach to both farming and winemaking. And I think they're very representative of this new phase of California winemaking. So for some listeners out there, maybe they remember in the 1990s when Robert Parker was really coming into his own and all of a sudden you had wines that were like 16% alcohol, really big full-bodied wines So this led to things like The Prisoner or things that were just like these huge hulking wines. And what Shant and Diego were trying to say is like, 
look, those wines are fine, but there's also this really beautiful, more transparent style of winemaking where you don't taste the winemaker's hand as much, where it's not like all I get out of this wine is like chocolate and vanilla, like aromas of oak, you know, and things like that. But what if you just like tasted the vineyard in the glass? And that's what I think I they're that. able to do. So this is kind of like that era of new California wine where Aaron, you might be able to tell on the back of the bottle, but what's the percent alcohol of that? This is 12 and a half. 12 and a half percent for a Cabernet yeah. Sauvignon, which, you know, for listeners out there, most Cabernet Sauvignon that you might buy that's part of that old kind of paradigm is clocking in at like 15% alcohol. Mm -hmm. So this is much lighter, much more fresh, and to me, a lot more food friendly. Um, yeah. It goes with so many things. We already talked about the value of acidity when it comes to barbecue, something that can kind of cleanse your palate out as you're getting like, you know, fatty bite after fatty bite, um, something more rich and creamy, some acidity can really brighten things up. So I don't know. I love the wines that Sean and Diego make um, because they are such soulful wines. They're, they're really, really delicious. And it helps that they're just two really nice dudes. So. And what area are they getting juice from? Is it from? So they work with a variety of different fruits, some of which comes from Carneros, some of which comes from the Mendocino Valley. Okay. Um, so these are two young guys. They don't necessarily have access to those blue chip vineyards in like Rutherford or in Oakville. So what they're doing is they're partnering with these multi-generation farmers in lesser known regions, which is why I think these wines Smart. also offer like incredible value. These mm -hmm. vines are like 70, 80 years old. These are historical vines that just, they're not necessarily in the most well-regarded places, places that have gotten, you know, hundred points from Robert Parker or whoever else. <laughs> So because of that, I think that they offer incredible value. Um, and the fact that they're so involved in the farming process goes a really long way as well. Yeah, the Mendocino Valley is like popping off now. Like now, I think some of the most exciting wineries, Las Haras is a producer that I know Aaron's worked with in the past, but that's a winery that also gets a lot of fruit from this area as well. I'm gonna have to do a, a wine tour when I can. <laughs> Again, it's been, a, it's been a long time. We gotta get you up to the promised land, brother. We yeah. gotta make this happen. I did back in a, in a past life when I was married. It was like, mm -hmm. uh, we, I, but not, I don't know if I went to Mendocino, but it's Mendocino County, but it's, uh, that's, we, it's need also, to get, we need to get single Kevin to wine country stat. <laughs> I know. I single know. Kevin. Soon. I love single it. Single Kevin. <laughs> soon, soon. Yeah. At least these are things like too, and all, but also to this plant seeds literally in people's minds too, as to, as to regions and places to go visit that aren't yeah. just like, what is it the 39 or something that's uh just or like a little wine bus that they take around it's just there's a, there's a lot more to see especially in california yeah skip the traffic go visit some of these off the beaten path smaller producers well this was this part beautifully so aki's dish was very very heavy i mean i feel like he listed every single luxury ingredient you can have on a plate so we had foie we had truffles we had bone marrow I mean he kept saying something I was like I can't tell if you're joking or not um, but the dish was amazing and beautiful and very warm like it it really obviously in Houston it had already warmed up a little bit but from where he's from in Finland it was still you know negative 32 degrees so they still are eating that that way and it was kind of interesting pairing something that I knew without trying it I knew it would be younger fresher a little bit riper because that's their style they're they're really not trying to bottle stuff that requires a lot of aging stuff that's ready to be drunk now and so when I opened it when we got it in I thought this is going to be perfect and it really did it just paired beautifully and I also think it got people thinking differently about how Cabernet Sauvignon is is capable of tasting because it didn't necessarily meet the expectation of what what Chris has described you know the really big high high alcohol just gonna blow your mind with just bigness type of wine this is really you know lighter and prettier and I think much more expressive and and I agree 100% much more food friendly it really really went with this dish well because it didn't fight those the food didn't fight the wine they really just went well together um, we've got a couple of bottles left and we're reserving them all for private events. So sorry, um, you can't yeah. get it at the restaurant, but um, we've got some wine dinners uh, that we're doing um, and just really excited to pour this for people and introduce them to La Lune. And one of the next wines that we have is one that I became familiar with while working with Chris at Camerata, um, Stoltman Vineyards La Quadria. Another really cool story. We're kind of transitioning 
into the new vintage. This is the 2020 is the new vintage. We were Actually previously, yeah, we were previously <laughs> pouring the 2019. Um, it's a really cool story. Chris, are you, I know you're pretty familiar with them, but do you want to speak to um, the audience about the Stoltman Vineyards or do you want me to? No, I'm happy to talk about it. So um, Pete Stoltman runs the winery. I actually had the opportunity to get him on my podcast with his vineyard manager, Ruben. And the two of them were kind of oh, talking great. about the La Quadria project. And it's the idea that, you know, so often when we talk about like sustainable winemaking, our minds always go to like the work that's done in the vineyard. But sometimes we don't always think about like that human element that we talked about, like who's actually doing the farming. You know, part of the appeal of not spraying pesticides and herbicides is that there are going to be people out there helping pick these grapes or tending to these vines, and you don't want all those chemicals on their hands and things like that. Um, and I think that um, Pete Stoltman took it a step further and thought, well, what are we doing to better the lives of the people working at our estate? Who Who is actually benefiting from picking these grapes? And so what they did is um, Pete hired people to work full-time at the winery rather than just like seasonal work it's like no we'll employ you all year round rather than just for like the two weeks when we need people to pick grapes or whatever and what he did is he wanted them to be really invested in the wine itself rather than just like be siloed off and be like i'm going to pick these grapes and then whatever's going to happen to them is going to happen to them what they've done is that pete and ruben have partnered with all of the different people that pick these grapes and they actually get some thoughts and they they're able to help kind of like guide the blend so this wine is a blend normally syrah is the base but there's also some sangiovese in there which isn't super common right it's a grape variety we associate mm -hmm. with italy um there's also some grenache in there typically so it's kind of like a more atypical blend a lot of like red fruit a lot of brambly characters really kind of like tart red cherries going on mm -hmm. uh, kind of like a peppery that. note as well but the people that actually pick the grapes help decide the blend. I love that. To learn a little bit more about the winemaking side and the proceeds of this particular cuvee go back to them. So they're very invested in not just the picking of the grapes, but also the winemaking side of things. And it's cool to be able to give back to the La Quadria project. Um, it's a wine made by the people for the people. That's love that. And it's, it is our most popular wine. Whether or not you know the story, um, people just love it. I mean, I think it's proof that the more you've got your hands in it, the and the more experienced you are in the whole process, like just how amazing the product could be. And this, this is one of our most popular wines that we sell. I also, I know this is so Stoltman does some higher end wines. Is that correct? Like this is definitely their more entry level uh, economic wine, but it's. You would never know. I mean, you drink it and it's no, just it a tastes. really, I think the value is is there. It's a really good wine. And and every year it changes slightly, as Chris said, but like I, I feel like every year I'm impressed with what is in the bottle. And how nice is it for people to be able to take ownership in something like that? That's almost unheard of. Yeah. And circling back to what Aaron talked about much earlier, like when we were talking about Kush, right? Like you can get a glass of this and you're like, oh, it's a red blend. It's really tasty. So you don't even need like all this additional backstory. For some people, you know, that wine made by the people for the people, that is what will resonate. But then for other people, it's just like, mm, yeah. it's a really good red blend and that's mm -hmm. enough. And I think yeah. that's the other really challenging thing as a wine professional is like, sometimes you're so excited about these things. Yeah. Like you just are like a fire hydrant, just spewing out information. And it's recognizing what's going to really resonate with that person on the other side of the counter. What should I lead with? What should I start with? And that's where that salesmanship really comes into it. And I'm sure Aaron, you deal with that a lot when you're coaching the staff, like when someone's looking at the list and you see their eyes start to glaze over a bit, like how do you get them to quickly decide on something and get them something they really like? You know, do you start with that human side? Do you start with like the, the pairing notes or like the flavors? Like, what do you do when it comes to coaching the team? So I look at it two ways. So there's the customer aspect and you decide instantaneously when a customer walks up, you know, do they know what they want? And are they looking for a grape or are they looking for a wine? Because they're, you know what I mean? And so we assess that pretty quickly. But I found that the key to success is really focusing on the staff, the people who are selling the wine. And the Stolman was a very early leader in sales for us. And so I was always trying to understand exactly why. I think A, it's a good wine. They all enjoyed drinking it. But um, 
everything about this wine resonated with them, right? We tell the story to them about how this wine is really made by the farmers and the, the, the people that work the land make the wine and how unusual that is. We talk about how they're employed year round, which is really unusual. So farming is very migratory. Um, and that is, we, we think of that as like the olden times and that's not true. I mean, there's a lot of industries today, including farming, where you are not necessarily employed by the same place in the same location year round. The Stoltman changed that. They said, no, we want, we want our farmers to be here year round. We want them to raise their families here and have stability. And so you explain that to people in the food and beverage industry, and they are immediately like, they love that. They love the story. So I think without ever really knowing the, the root of it, I think that this is why Stoltman was an early leader for us in sales because our staff was selling it. They were really proud to have this wine on our list. They knew it was going to be good in the glass. So they felt pretty confident that the customer was going to enjoy drinking it because it's a very enjoyable wine, but they really wanted to support this winery and these producers. And so I think that's what really resonates with my staff. And I think that's that in turn makes it a good seller on our list. And I have the, so there's a, an interesting story. They always have black and white labels. Um, the original label, not the original label, label for the quadria, but the, the label that I got introduced to was a sickle. And I remember researching it and it had a lot to do obviously with, with farming practices. So the sickle was my imprint of like what Stoltman quadria bottle labels look like. So the 2019 label is the moons. And then there's a verse on the front that translates into run with the wolves and you learn to howl. And I can only assume that that's kind of a metaphor for the winemaking and how like if you live amongst the grapes and work amongst the grapes, you learn how to work with the grapes and make excellent wine. And then the current vintage is another, you know, black and white label. And this one, it's a little harder to tell what it is, but um, after researching it, it's a rootstock. And so this kind of tells a story about what's been important for them over the past couple of years. Have you had a chance to try the new one? No. So that's actually a really interesting thing is that in France, like they don't import any California wine. There's like no wine from the United States that makes its way over to uh, Europe. Not really a thing. Is it Which because... Is- is it it's for a any particular thing. reason? <laughs> it's, I, I think I think it's a combination of things, right? Part of it's pride. Like, why would we bring in California wine when we have our own wine? And the other thing is that within the EU, right, there's a lot of flexibility with bringing wine from Spain into France or from Germany into France or vice versa. Whereas getting wine all the way across the Atlantic, paying whatever taxes you need to on it, it's so much more expensive to get that wine over. It just doesn't make sense financially. So a wine like Stoltman would be like triple, perhaps what it might be sitting on the shelf, you know, at a, at a store. So why pay, you know, $60 for a bottle of Stoltman when, you know, you could get it for so much cheaper in the United States. So yeah, it's a tricky thing. Certainly been one of the highlights is getting access to a lot of French wines that are significantly cheaper in France than they are in the U S for that same reason, you know, just getting them all the way over across the Atlantic is such a pain. What, what would you say is the world view of American winemaking? I think it's very much rooted in that kind of 90s tradition of the bigger, the riper, the better. You know, I think that for better or worse, right, like those wines sold a lot. And there's a lot of people that still strongly associate American winemaking with that super ripe extracted style. And it sells. So like there's not really an incentive for a lot of these wineries to change. And like we talk about how Le Lun is changing the game, but they represent, you know, 1% of 1% of the California wine out there, right? So I think people like you and me are excited about it. But the average person, if they say, I want a Cabernet from California, and you pour them that they're going to be taken aback, you know? Yeah. So yeah, I mean, it's a it's a challenging thing. But like I said earlier, right, that's why Baskin and Robbins has 31 flavors. You know, there's something for everyone. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. So we now have a Sangiovese. It's called The Source. It's from Texas. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. We have a Sangiovese no. on the menu and we're still pouring the Graffito. Um, we're into the new vintage, but um, it's, it's similar. And the Graffito is very clearly what people want when they say they want a cab, even though it's not Cabernet Sauvignon, um, mm-hmm. you know, it's Cab Franc. But it definitely, I think, satisfies like that more full-bodied 
more fruit forward spice and, and richness. And so that one does really well. And I'm going to say they all do really, really well because we've narrowed it down. Our menu is so small now that we only have things that have done well. <laughs> um, we, you know, we know what works and we, we're pretty good at figuring out what our consumers are going to want. But they kept the Graffito Cab Franc does really well. It's, and I'm looking forward to opening that in a future podcast. Well, I don't know if you and Kevin have talked about it in previous episodes, but I've always felt like white wine, especially German white wine, for instance, like to me, sometimes is a better pairing than red wine with a lot of barbecue. I don't know. Have, has that come up in a previous episode? No, we haven't really talked about like white versus red or what would make stylistically something a really good barbecue pairing. I speak a lot of acid. Just like in my cooking and, and in my drinking, acid to me And in your always... social life, your concert going, <laughs> your... Your divulging secrets. Um, no, the acid's so critical to me um, to maintain structure and balance. Um, but anytime you're bringing food and wine together, that's the, that's, that's the pinnacle of importance when it comes to what you need to have a presence of. And you mentioned white wines, obviously there's acid and red wines too, but I think white wines can really express acid nicely. Um, and it's a little bit more forward. So tell us a little bit. So you, you helped us do our wine list. So this was, we started talking about this probably a year ago. And I think we created a really phenomenal wine list together. What do you think are the most important types of wine and characteristics of wine when it comes to pairing with foods that are barbecue like heavy rich smoky absolutely so you already hit on acidity which i think is incredibly important but then the other thing is the texture of the wine um and that texture is always like a challenging thing to kind of describe i'll i'll say that a wine has like a really round texture or it's like really angular really sharp and I realized when I start talking in those abstract terms, I lose some people, but for me, at least it's a combination of the way it feels on your palate, as well as that acidity, as well as that alcohol, all of those things kind of play into the texture of the wine. And to me, wines that are really like sharp and angular that have that acidity, that kind of like really bright character, those are what pair so well with barbecue. Maybe that's also like a peppery thing that goes on in there, like which you find in Syrah, for instance, which you find in um, some Italian wines, uh, Sangiovese, um, even when it's grown in Texas, even like it still has that very like peppery kind of potpourri spice going on. And that to me is so, so important when you're having things that are, you know, heavily spiced or heavily smoked. So when I think of like barbecue, one of my all time favorite pairings is Riesling. And I know we did an event together where we poured Riesling with barbecue, but to me yeah. that, that just really like sharp, kind of like almost like knife, just cutting through y y your, your palate and like everything else in there is just like such a amazing thing. I mean, we talk about acid, right? Like that's basically barbecue sauce. It's acid and sugar, right? Um, yeah. There are other elements going on, but that's really what it's there for. And to me, this is just like a boozy barbecue sauce. It's Riesling and it's so fucking good. Yeah. So that German wine event, I go back to that event in my head all the time. A, because we really pushed our limits in terms of like how many people can we put in this building and how many um, wine glasses can we pour, wash and repeat, right? Um, so we really pushed a lot of our limits. But what we also did was I think we blew people's minds as to what you could do with wine and food together. And those pairings were amazing. And we introduced people to different, different grapes, different styles. You know, everybody thinks of Riesling when they think of German wine. Um, but we had a Schoireba. Did I say that right? It's mm -hmm. been, it's been like eight months since I said it. And I think that was a really, really popular wine amongst the, the tasting that we offered. And it, I think really got people thinking differently about a barbecue restaurant, not just barbecue and consuming food. Right. But like they came into our restaurant when we were having this big wine event, um, which was sponsored by wines of Germany and, and the wine selection we were pouring was phenomenal. And different. I think there was, you know, it really showed people the variety that you can, that you can get. I still have bottles of the Von Buell sparkling because for my house, like we bought it, we bought extra because I really enjoy drinking it. It's a really, really nice bottle of wine. 
Um, yeah, I think that would be a big takeaway for people in the audience that are listening is that, you know, German wine is more than what you might think it is. You may think that it's just sweet Riesling and there are dry Rieslings. There's Pinot Noir grown there. There's Chardonnay being grown there. There's all these other things going on. Schroy Reba, which is like one of my all-time favorite grapes. It tastes like ruby red grapefruit yeah. and lychee and all this other cool shit. It's like such a great wine. Yeah, drink more German wine. Drink more... Uh, Riesling, both sweet and dry Riesling. Um, Drink that barrel at <laughs> Peter Lauer, um, one of the one of the goats in the uh, Mosul. So really great wines for sure. So I mean, what's next for y'all? What what else is going on at Fiji's Barbecue these days? So we're you know we're nine ten months in and we're getting our footing. It took us a little while. It took us a while to to get settled. And I mean that in all the normal ways, right? Like to understand our business and to really train and hone our staff. Um, but, but the like tertiary effects of, of getting your feet wet are understanding that what your role is, what, what is the vision of your concept, right? Because we spend years writing business plans, defining our concepts, and then you open and all of that kind of shifts a little bit, right? What does the public really want? What does the public really need? What about our community? And so I think 10 months in, I can say that we're really starting to understand our purpose here and what we can offer to our community. And I am super happy to say, I think wine is a big part of that. Wine is, I think, one of the things that's going to shape and define us as as a concept and as a business. I'm always trying to find the balance between what I like and what I wanna promote versus what I know our consumers are gonna like yeah. and, and wanna enjoy. And I'm happy to say that, that they're not that different. Like I'm finding that um, that people will, people like our, our wine menu. As long as we're really confident and able to sell it and speak to it, then they're there to, to buy it they want to drink and enjoy it we built a space that people like hanging out in which is what I'm most proud of and so we have this huge opportunity to sell wine that's really where we're at right now you know this podcast is a thing I'm really passionate about and and really not only getting people to think about barbecue and wine but it's got me back into those old you know six seven years ago wine education like I brought all my books from home um, I've got all my tasting notes from when I was studying. And when I say studying, I mean like harder than any college class I've ever taken studying. These are all my wine notes from Camerata. I love it. I love it. Um, yeah, because I mean, the standard for what was expected in terms of knowledge and professionalism at Camerata was so high. I felt a good but real pressure to to hold my own and, and know what I was talking about. And this mm -hmm. has really given me that excitement back. So I'm going back and I'm reading all my old notes and I'm buying more wines. We were just in New Orleans and we went to Bacchanal. Oh, amazing. It's like one of my favorite places in the world. And, you know, I brought back like a Magnum and um, just a lot of different wines and super excited to open them. Although, you know, I only drink when I have company that enjoys. So next time you're in Houston, hit me up because uh, I'll open some of these for you. Well, the yeah. neighborhood that you're in too, there's not really another wine destination in that area, right? I mean, that area of Spring Branch, like if someone wants to drink cool wine, like where do they go? There's not, there's not like a cool wine shop in the area. I mean, there's definitely restaurants with wine lists, but I think we offer a slightly different uh, type of wine perspective. And so you can come here and we do, we get people in the afternoon that come just to drink a glass of wine. Um, and yeah, it's, it's phenomenal. It makes my heart sore. That, that should be, sore that's too. the name of my new wine, right? If I were to make a wine, it would be like, makes my heart sore. It's just so great to see people in a barbecue restaurant drinking wine, but especially if they're there for the wine. Um, and that's really, that's really And also cool. probably to see people order multiple glasses. Yes. And to watch my staff, who most of whom did not know how to open a bottle of wine when they started, to see them walk to a table, open a bottle, and do, you know, like a, a bottle presentation, um, it, it's just so rewarding. And we've come, we've worked so hard to get to this point, so. And also, yeah, rewarding meaning that also because when you envision this restaurant and then it turning out this way, that's 
phenomenal. Yeah. What did I miss? We talked a little bit about our German wine event that we did a few, gosh, we did it towards the very beginning of our opening. So about a month after we opened, we did a wine event that Chris yeah. was responsible for helping make happen. And it was in partnership with Wines of Germany. And we named the event Rhinestone Cowboy because oh, the, the Rhine is a wine region in Germany. And it was huge. I've never like, seen this many. The, 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 the line between like a shit show and like a wild success, we were like teetering on that line the whole time because it was just so busy. We were running out of glasses. Yeah. Like, yeah, it was, it was wild. People so you were, were there. Yeah. So yes. it was an activation that we did with wines of Germany. So the German wine council is responsible for like promoting German wine in the United States. So when I was doing that, like um, consulting work before starting my MBA, I partnered with them to do a variety of different events okay. in Texas. And one of them was this uh, happy hour and we picked out a handful of different wines. Obviously, we wanted to have a Riesling there, but we also wanted to introduce people to the other grapes of Germany and different styles of wine, not just sweet, not just dry, but sparkling. And we just like had at it. We sold it as a flight. You could get individual glasses and people oh, just like so went after it. It's more people than we've ever had in this building and more wine glasses than we've ever washed and polished and then reused in this building all night long. But um, we had people calling us saying, I want to make a reservation. We don't take reservations, but we were like, we'll set aside a table. We had like entire tables of German residents that were, you know, that are in Houston, they're businessmen. And oh, that's nice. they were so excited to see, and they didn't know going into it, what we were going to offer. I think they were just hopeful because of the name of the event. And um, so many of those people still come in and talk to me about how much they enjoyed that event. And just the fact that it existed in their neighborhood and that they were able to come and drink some of these wines that they grew up and they're familiar with, but that they don't see here. And so it was awesome. Is that something that can happen again or... Are you not? No, I mean, Wines of Germany, I, if you're listening, Wines of <laughs> Germany, hit, hit up Chris Caldoyan and Fiji's Barbecue. No, I would love to do that again. It was, mm. it was so much fun. Um, this time we'll be a little bit more prepared with glassware, but so much fun. Yeah, at least you have some free planning you could do for that. And also, too, like, <laughs> it was a pen, good problem to have. No, that's yeah. a good problem. And then there probably would be pent, more pent up anticipation for something like that, too. Definitely. So, what, so is, so are you going back to, France? Gonna, yeah. So, your... so the program that I'm doing in Seattle, it's a 10 month MBA. Um, most MBAs are two years. This one's a much more consolidated program. So I started in August, I'll graduate in June. Um, but there's a one month exchange here at the Kellogg School of Management. So I arrived last Saturday, um, started classes. Uh, Kellogg Wright is known for marketing. So there's some really great courses to take here. Obviously great networking to be done. So, um, yeah, it's been fun. I've been here for a week now. It's really cool to see. But then at the end of April, I fly back to France. Uh, we'll continue being there for at least a few months and then trying to figure out what the game plan will be after that. That was, I was going to ask you, what's the game plan, but you'll try Man. to figure that out. Yeah, I don't know. We'll, we'll have to answer that in episode two together. Yes, definitely. Um, yeah, right. But, yeah, you know, I think what's really interesting to me is, and I'm sure some of your listeners are familiar with MBAs, but like it very much feeds into very specific industries, mostly finance and consulting. There aren't many people that either work in the hospitality industry or just in the food and beverage industry that have this kind of, you know, MBA. And I'm trying to figure out what to do with it, um, trying to figure out the best way to utilize it to make a difference in the communities that I care about. And I don't know. We'll see what ends up happening. But is there somewhere you want to live? Yeah. So mostly uh, the recruiting that I'm doing is either in the United States. And if I'm in Europe, it has to be in a market where I can function in English. My French is fine, but most jobs in France require fluency in French. Ah. Um, so really the markets that I'm looking at are London, Amsterdam, Berlin, Brussels, um, and then Spain, I'm fluent in Spanish. So either Madrid or Barcelona, something like that. So if I were to stay in Europe, those are the markets that I'd be in. If I were to come back to the US, then really wherever uh, would be cool. So it's exciting. Like this yeah. is, there's so much to look forward to for you. That, and so what are, are there, is there anything that we didn't touch on, Aaron, that you want to touch on? Because this is, this has been phenomenal more than anything. Like I, 
I've been I've been listening to your podcast, but I want to listen to all of them now. It's been a wild ride. It's been super cool. No, I'm sure. ex- but I'm excited to go through. And uh, if there's any specific episodes that you're interested in people listening to or to get a, a good taste of kind of what we were talking about, if you have yeah. the time to send over or. I'll yeah, I'll send over a couple through. of the some of my favorites. But uh, yeah, I've had some some cool guests along the way. Aaron being one of them, Sean and Diego being another. But uh, I'll send you a couple of my faves. So. Cool. Awesome. And what are all the different ways people can get a hold of you or follow what you're doing? Yeah, so you can follow me on Instagram at Braised Thoughts. Um, braised, like the cooking technique, thoughts, like what you're thinking, not T-H-O-T. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I'd say the podcast is uh, by the glass podcast on Instagram, or you can stream it wherever you get your audio content. Um, it's kind of yeah, the best way to buy the glass and you can buy the it. glass. There you go. Excellent. Cool guys. Well, thank, well, thank you, you all so much for having me. Thank you. It was so yeah, fun catching you. up. Yeah, this has yes. been fantastic. I, we, I really appreciate your time and I know that our listeners are going to love the heck out of this. So, uh, so that was so great to have Chris. What that was yeah. just that. Thank you uh, for uh, your connection with her. That's I, 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 I know people are really going to love that. And I'm super excited that we had that. So thank him. If you, if you talk to him personally, again, just thank him for being on the show. I'll, I'll send an email, but let's, let's talk, let's talk a little bit about uh, Fiji's barbecue and, uh, and wine. I also, I did want to say that I got myself two bottles of this. Can you pronounce I, it? For- the uh, Pledge of Chiarly Vecchia Modena. And it's the Lambrusco. Or it's a, the Lambrusco, uh, yeah. And it, and just for people to know that we had shown at the last, like it's got an interesting way to open. And it took me some, I, I mentioned to Aaron off, off camera that I had used pliers to open it up, which she explained. Listen, it. everything is a wine tool. Yeah, so so pliers yeah. included. But yeah, that's, it's an interesting, like we talked about in the last episode, it's that like 1892 version of the bottle and that's that's what they were using that's like one of the original pressurized um wine cork uh setups and so yeah. pretty cool and um, it's the, it's so refreshing it it's it's different than i imagine i could drink it all the time like it's i think it's a, like yeah. you had said it's a perfect pairing with barbecue perfect pairing i think i would say with anything i and i almost i i was thinking about taking this one i haven't told them yet i was thinking about taking this one too to moose craft barbecue here in los angeles because they have a beer program but bring it and then we can and maybe i can take some photos and, or video and just at least have a chance for them to try it because i i'd like to open you know expand their horizons to i it. love i love that idea and it, and it is it's so good it's a great meat and barbecue mm-hmm. wine so i think I think yeah, they'll yeah. enjoy it. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's uh so if you're if they're watching, this will be a trick to see if they actually watched it. <laughs> but I wanted to I wanted to bring up because I had ordered for you guys and it came and I, I've said this before, anything I order for you comes really quick. And I don't want to like put pressure on you now that you have to ship things fast, but it's like I got it very quickly. But I got your barbecue sauces and I'd like to talk about all five of them. Well, one of them is a is a hot sauce, right? Or is, are they all they're because uh, I haven't tried them well, yet because I don't want to open them until we had talked. They're all barbecue sauces. We have one yeah. labeled hot. Um, it's our gochujang. Oh, that's gochujang. So okay, okay. it's got it's got some heat to it, but it's not the consistency of a hot sauce. So it's not like fermented red peppers that I are understood pureed. Okay. And yeah. which one? Which one? Your favorite of the group is the Texas. Oh, which one? My, was? Yeah, my favorite's the Texas Gold. Okay. Um, this is the Carolina style. So we stole the name Carolina Gold. Is something that you see around. So we call ours Texas Gold, and it's vinegar and mustard based um so there's that that's where it gets its kind of yellow color from there's whole mustard seeds um inside and i actually don't like yellow mustard at all but i love the flavor of mustard in things when it's just like kind of imparted i think be honest i don't i don't like like yellow mustard either i I like but i like the like ones with seeds and stuff but i don't like yeah so I, this I think we're the only class. ones that don't like that. And I, I think that's no, there's people that are going to be like, what the heck? People, you tell people you don't like yellow mustard and you'd be surprised how many people come forward with their secret. Like, yeah, I don't like yellow mustard either. Apparently <laughs> we're just all too ashamed to like admit it publicly. Yeah, yeah. Was this yeah, a sauce so from day, was this a day one sauce or is this, this one? This is a day one sauce. Okay. Yeah. This is a day one sauce. Um, we'd been serving it at pop-ups and stuff, but then we traveled and spent some time in the Carolinas and we came back and like just really solidified the recipe. And so it's been on our menu and available since we opened our Grumman Plaza location. 
And has and have really quick, have these all been available to, to buy before or is this kind of a newer thing too? This is a newer thing. So we, yeah. we've been working on this. This is a project that's been two years in the making. Oh, cool. Um, getting these bottled, getting the recipes right, getting like a co-packer to, to nail it down specifically and then working with somebody to create the labels. Um, that's a whole thing. It's a whole thing and, and slowed down significantly because of the pandemic. Um, but, but we're here and we've had these available since before the holidays. So we sold these retail sauces during the holidays. And I'm telling you, like, we could not keep them stocked. Like they just, it was like, every time I turned around, we were like buying more, buying more, buying more. So we did. And, and you, did. and you showed them, you have them at the spring branch location and the tour that you gave. And I'll put a link to that tour, which is just so killer. Uh, but do you have that? Do you have them at the Greenway Plaza location too for sale? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you can and buy them at both locations and online and they come and, <laughs> with an and elite. they come quickly. <laughs> They'll I'll be there to, tomorrow. <laughs> no, no. I'll pat our general manager on the back for being yeah, very on top of, of the shipping. Cool. Um, but yeah, so Texas Gold is my favorite. Do okay. you have a favorite? I know I have an open yet. I, I, oh, okay. I, I wanted to wait. I'm going to try them and I'll then I'll kind of give my my two cents. And we could maybe talk about them in the next episode and I can take some photos and things. But I, I wanted to wait because I knew that if they were open, I would I'd spill them. <laughs> I'd make a mess of it. So the well, I can one... tell you, I can tell you the fan favorite. This is the most popular sauce that we sell in retail packaging. And I it's the I'll, Alabama White. I was holding yeah. it. I was gonna guess, yes. Alabama White. I so like if to... you're if you're in our restaurant dining in, we have three sauces on the table, the Alabama white, the Texas gold, and then our sweet red, which is just a traditional style. Okay. Those are on the table. And of the three, this is the one that we um, go through the least amount of. But when it comes to being in this bottle, people come in. I mean, we have people coming to the store just to buy this. They leave without barbecue. They just buy the sauce. And I think really? it's because it's really versatile. They, like I always hear people go, oh, I use it as a salad dressing or we put it on, you know, everything. I feel like it's pretty, it's kind of like, mayonnaise or ranch it's just kind of like a universal sauce um, and it's a true like what traditionally you would chicken would be something that people were putting it on it yeah and so the name that the name albium white sauce is derived from where its origins come from i mean mm -hmm. this sauce is is seen a lot in alabama mm -hmm. typically served with smoked chicken wings or smoked turkey it's very poultry friendly you think of and, chris lily and you think of alabama yes. white sauce yeah yep and um, so he's- oh, I'm so he's, excited to try that. Yeah, so that one's really great. And then this is our other, like the third one that we have available like for self-service at the restaurant is the Sweet Red. So this is a traditional Texas style barbecue sauce. We call it Sweet Red because there is, there's ketchup in it, there's brown sugar. So it's got a little bit of sweetness to it, but a ton of spice and flavor, um, really good sauce. And then Patrick created two sauces that are, um, kind of unique, not necessarily to us, but I think one of them speaks regionally. So this is, we call it the hot red, but this is a gochujang barbecue sauce. And Patrick lived in Korea. A lot of people don't know that, but Patrick lived in Korea. That's where he first served in the army before he was um, uh, stationed in Iraq. And but so he thought he was going to stay there, right? Like for yeah. I mean, I think he kind of assumed that that might be where he spent his entire military career was in Korea, but he invested a lot of his free time which there was a significant amount of free time because I don't know if you know this but being stationed in Korea there's not a lot of active military stuff going on I mean every once in a while North Korea does something and he was basically like miles from the DMZ um, zone demilitarized zone so he was pretty close to the um, North Korean border not a whole lot to do mm -hmm. but he very much like immersed himself in like the culinary culture there so he came back with the an affinity for gochujang and being in Houston where there's a huge Korean population we have a lot of opportunity to eat it and enjoy it but also there's a there's a whole community that that wants it back so this is this is one of that's our kind of like sneaky really sauces. Cool. I yeah. might actually I might order this for because I had texted a friend like last week I'm like do you have gochujang in your fridge right now and uh he's not Korean and he's like oh yeah yeah of course I'm like well that's cool I, I don't I it, should <laughs> it's like a pantry staple you should have it in your fridge I should I know yeah yeah there's a lot of a lot of shoulds but that's good okay, okay cool I'm excited yeah shoot I don't know which one to try first and then there's the mop sauce so then there's the mop sauce so I always turn this one upside down and shake it because this one's the thinnest sauce and it has the most like actual particle so there's um a lot of herbs red chili flakes 
and things that will settle to the bottom. So always shake this one up. Um, this is what we mop our whole hog with. Um, so this is the exact same sauce. Um, we mop it as we're smoking it. And then we also toss it in um, after it's smoked when we're pulling. Um, I have heard from many people that this is a great marinade. Um, huh. So I'll need, I'll need to go home and try that. Yeah, I'll try um, that too. That's a good idea. Yeah. And so really good sauce. This was featured in Men's Health magazine um our mop sauce yeah back nice. back like right as we were just getting these to the market um and had them available men's health did an article um so yeah, it also it's the, it's also so it's a health product you're saying too it's also has uh as uh, yeah i mean you, you put mean, it on <laughs> you put it you put it on proteins right so yeah yeah for the yeah for the it's a paleo. vehicle for healthy food <laughs> Yeah, um, but, yeah, that's awesome. Okay, okay, it's okay. That's cool. So all five sauces. I'll put photos below. I'll put a link to purchase it online, but also, you know, come to both locations and you'll get a chance to purchase there. And they, but then during the holiday season, get them early because we're not at the holiday season yet. But <laughs> it'll be there in two seconds. But that's yeah. well, it depends on what holidays we're talking about. We've got Memorial oh, Easter. Day, Easter's Easter is coming up. Yeah. I actually think this is a good Easter sauce. This goes with things that I would see on an Easter table, like chicken okay. and that's a good idea. Um, vegetables. Um, but yeah, so holidays we have coming up, Easter, Memorial Day, 4th of July, okay. Father's Day. Father's Day is a big barbecue hey, sauce day. Don't forget Mother's uh, Day, right? Mother's Day, big barbecue sauce day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, All summer yeah. long. It's a, it's a, <laughs> this summer will be like, hopefully it'll be a summer that people can celebrate more. So, and also too, how yeah. cool would it look like I mean, if you had the, had one or two of these on your table and people were like, Fiji Spark, like they would think, you know, they would know that you, you know, had some sense of, of taste and style and that's cool. That's exactly. Cool. They would know you knew what was up. Yeah. And so for Easter, so what do you have coming up for Easter? Okay. So we love throwing parties and we're throwing another party. So on Saturday, April 20, I'm sorry, Saturday, April 16th, it's the Saturday before Easter Sunday, we are throwing a big party at Puget's Barbecue Spring Branch. We'll okay. have crawfish, live music, the Easter Bunny. So yeah, you can come and take photos with the Easter Bunny. We've contracted to have them available from 12 to 2. Okay, and 12 to the, two. It's, it's all free. I mean, the food isn't free, but the event is free. You don't have to buy tickets or anything. Just show up. We're going to have a, an Easter display with balloons and everything for the Easter photos. And then we're also going to do an Easter egg hunt at 1130, led by our Easter bunny. Cool. Um, and so bring the kids, dress up if you want to do the photos, and then just come out and enjoy what is hopefully gorgeous weather and live music. And just we're really going to embrace spring. And, and will this be live music on the patio or live music indoors or other? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're hoping to have it on the patio. So unless the weather's bad and we have to move it inside, the plan is to have as much of this event outside as possible. Okay. Oh, that's awesome. That sounds like fun. And, then, and crawfish, like sadly, I've, I've, I've had crawfish like a tuffet. I've, I've never done the whole crawfish thing. So this is a crawfish boil thing, right? Yeah, this is a crawfish boil. So we're, we're buying like three or 400 pounds of crawfish. Um, <laughs> Patrick's going to be setting up a tent outside in the parking lot and just cooking it out there all day long. Um, we'll also have our full menu available. So you can come in and order anything off of our okay. normal menu. Um, but in addition, we're going to have um, crawfish and it's, well, it's you'll be buying it like, season. like a, by a pound by the pound and then, or is that how I yeah, so we'll now. sell the crawfish by the pound and then it'll come with, this is a question people already always have, does it come with like the sausage and the potatoes and the corn? The corn. So all that's going to be part of it. So it's okay, sold cool. by the pound and includes those things. Um, and yeah, it's just, we just want to celebrate spring and, um, you know, having kids, we wanted to do something kind that's of fun, awesome. that's, that's very family friendly. That's fun. We're doing an Easter egg hunt and I'm, you know, I'm not mean, we're going to fill these Easter eggs with some legit treats for the kids. <laughs> Um, so there will be candy. You seem so mean. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, have you ever seen a child open an Easter egg and it didn't have anything in it? Yeah, no, That's I... a very sobering moment. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so we're, we're going to have little treats and all the Easter eggs. Not always chocolate because there's, you know, kids with allergies and stuff. Sure, yeah, and yeah, yeah, other good, types yeah. of candy too. But, um, okay. but yeah, so we're going to make it a fun day for everybody. Yeah. Do you have, like, we've never really talked about desserts. Like it's, you guys have, you have what, two desserts, right? Or do you guys have? We have three desserts at Spring Branch, and we used to have the same three desserts at Greenway, but um, we've 
get, change the menu a little bit at Greenway just to kind of scale back during the pandemic. So we're in the process of adding some back, but the PB&J chocolate cake is our number one dessert and that's available at both locations. You have uh, charro beans. Is that something that you had on your menu yes. before and now it's back or just? No. So we have, we have a very strange relationship with beans. So from the get-go, being a Texas barbecue restaurant, we made a choice not to have beans um, and people were upset about it. Um, we've had food critics make note of the fact that we did not have beans. Beans were absent on our barbecue menu and it was apparently like very, um, it was provocative. I mean, people were, everybody had an opinion about it. And, but we were constantly getting praised for all these amazing sides we have. So we were like, but we yeah. offer all this instead of beans. You can get beans anywhere, but we got the tip. I've always heard well, your sides were amazing. For a short period of time, we offered barracho beans at our Greenway location. This was pre-pandemic and they were vegan. So it was like, fine, we'll do your beans, but we're not going to make you happy about it. We're going to make them vegan. So we would, we would use the corn husks that we saved from our elote and make a stock um and so they were smoked so it kind of had this like smoky huh. almost meaty flavor but we were able to um to make them uh to keep them vegan well we had those around um then during the pandemic again we scaled everything back and then when we opened greenway we went nine months we made it nine months with no beans and then our um executive chef or chef de cuisine marco coleman wanted to do them as a special one day. It was just a side dish going with um, something we were offering. We were doing some uh, some tacos and he was like, can we do beans? And I was like, yeah, that's a great idea. The feedback we got on these beans was just so amazing. Everybody was so happy with them. You gotta put these on as a side. So I said, hey, should we finally break our own rule and, and put these charo beans on the menu? And they are so good. I mean, sometimes I just oh. order it and that's my meal. Don't tell anybody because I want people to buy more than charo beans when yeah. they come in. But like, they're just so good and they're hearty and they're filling and they have a ton of flavor. And that's, they're not vegan. Are they, this, 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 <laughs> the, new, the new version is not vegan at all. Not even close. And they're available at both locations? Yes. Okay. Ah, and they look phenomenal. And I'll, and I'll put a link to a photo below too. That's, uh, oh, that's cool. And, the, and that kind of leads me to a segue that I wanted to bring up, I think last episode, secret men, do you have a couple secret menu items or something? Is that? Yeah. Well, I mean, for a little while, the charro beans were one of our secret menu items, but now okay. they're on our regular menu. So they're not a secret menu item anymore. But the, so the secret menu items are just things that we as employees eat and oh, make okay. for ourselves. And then you like, you'll look over and go, oh my gosh, that's so great. So I think one of the first things that I put on social media was um, fries under our nacho setup. So instead of doing the um, the crackling, I saw a staff member eating fries one day and I was like, wow, those are like some loaded fries. Like those are some really awesome looking load loaded fries. So it's not a menu item, but you can request it. Um, and we've got a few other things like that. Um, I'll have to put together a little secret menu and maybe we can show some pictures and stuff in the next episode. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. So just just know that people should know that there are some secret items that. Yes. Oh, and how was how was the Houston Barbecue Festival? We talked about it a little bit with Chris, oh. but how 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 was that? The barbecue festival was amazing. I I you could tell people were so happy to be back together. And when I say people, I'm talking first it was the pitmasters. I mean, the joy everybody had all weekend about seeing people reuniting, but then, you know, they opened the venue up to 2000 people, ticketed guests, and you could, and the enthusiasm just spreads, right? Like, it, I mean, it was just so great. People were so excited to be back and it felt like years. I mean, it's only been two years, but it felt like many years. And so it and was- we've aged, we've aged a lot, but that seems, no, it do, and then from afar, it just looks so great. And I know it was something that the three of those guys had wanted to, you know, put on for yeah. so long. So it's nice that, and it just it looked fun, and you were able to come with Wyatt, and it was just like, yeah, it's a fun family friendly event, and um, so now that Wyatt's old enough to really enjoy it, it was nice having him there. It's also in the past two to three years, the amount of barbecue restaurants that have come that are new and and have been introduced to, you know, the Houston community is pretty significant. And so for a lot of people, this was their first time being at the festival because they couldn't do it the past two years. And so that was really nice too, is seeing some of the newcomers um, and everybody 
put out different food. It used to be all brisket, you know, eight years ago, everybody did brisket. And so you were just comparing whose brisket was best. And I think we've really, we've evolved past that. And so every, everybody was doing different things, having fun with their food. So really kind of creating something that was exciting from like place to place you were getting different foods. And it kind of, it highlights what Houston's all about. And Houston is a barbecue destination. If you're yeah. outside of Houston or you're outside of uh, Texas, it is a place that you need to put on your list to visit because it's, it's grown. It's amazing. It's, it's yeah. mind boggling. It's, I'm so happy for it. And it is, I feel bad though for you guys, because, um, you know, Wyatt messed everything up with Daniel Vaughn. I was going <laughs> to be an issue. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, luckily Daniel's a really understanding guy okay. and, uh, okay. He, he took the beating, but yeah, he sat on Wyatt's tricycle and Wyatt was like, no, <laughs> he was not having no. it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was, it was actually That's so hilarious. funny. It was so funny. And Daniel's got such like a good attitude about everything. He's, he's a oh, yeah, guy. Yeah. He's a good guy. Yeah. So it's, yeah. It, it was just, I noticed that and I, that's really funny. And I hope to remember to, to bring it, it up. Was a, it was a scolding. <laughs> Wyatt was scolding him like, no, you did not ask. I am not sharing. Get off. And that probably doesn't happen a whole lot for, uh, in barbecue circles to, to Daniel. So it's nice that it happens. I'm sure he he, pre, he probably appreciated more than anybody. Uh, yeah, let's hope so. Let's hope so. We'll see. Yeah, stay tuned. Let's see if you get any more write-ups. <laughs> I'm sure everything's fine. And let's see if he even listens to this too. That'll be an interesting. Is there anything else that we've missed? I think this has been almost a two-hour episode. I This has been so great and I think we've covered a lot about what you guys are doing, but also covered a lot about wine. And I, I'm learning so much more each episode and uh, I'm excited. Yeah. All right. Take care. Bye. All right. You too. Bye.